And welcome, and thank you for joining us on day three of the Denton's Labor and Employment Seminar for Ontario. Today is uh, the third and last day of the webinar series, and we're delighted that you've been able to join us. My name is Matthew Curtis. I'm a partner in the Toronto office of the Labor and Employment Group. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Russell Groves, also a partner in the Toronto office, Russell's practice is focused on labor law, and I'm also joined by my colleague Larissa Workowicz, an associate in the Toronto office whose practice is labor and employment. <clears throat> Today's webinar will include the following topics, uh, employee and contractor misclassification issues, um, Larissa will be speaking about the Accessible Canada Act and what federally regulated employers need to know. And Russell will be speaking on employment contract termination provision tune-up. Now uh, we'll begin with the first topic, which is on employee and contractor misclassification. And I'll be speaking on, on this topic. So this is definitely an issue that we've been seeing in the press uh, and certainly with respect to uh, cont contractor misclassification issues and problems. So we'll move to the next slide with respect to what I'll be speaking today. First is uh, a, a basic uh, introduction to the three different categories. Uh, what do they mean? La Secondly, there'll be a case law update. And third, uh, and likely the most important, are best practices and key takeaways from today's presentation. So the next slide is on what constitutes an independent contractor. So that's someone who is self-employed and provides services to customers through their own business or through th themselves. It's generally not limited to services just for one organization or one company. Um, and so the idea being that a true independent contractor can render services to a wide variety of organizations and is not dependent on just one. They can also hire uh, subcontractors or employees to assist them um, in rendering those services. An independent contractor also controls uh, how they work, where they work, uh, and their hours of work as well. Furthermore, um, one of the key tests is the tools and equipment, and, and for an independent contractor, it's, it's preferable that they use their own tools, like their own laptop, uh, their own office space, and uh, set up their own hours uh, subject to meeting the project requirement, which the project requirements are typically listed uh, as a services agreement as to what um, the deliverables are that the contractor is going to be performing. When it comes to pay, it should be done, you know, on a daily, weekly, or monthly fee basis, but it's certainly not uh, going to be wages that are uh, subject to income tax deductions by the company that's paying the contractor. And similarly, uh, a, a true independent contractor should not be on any employee benefit plan that a company has in place because uh, that would fall on the independent contractor to get for him or herself through his or her, her uh, business. Uh, the last point here is it's very important to have a written uh, contract that specifies that this is an independent contractor relationship preferably with a title that specifies independent contractor and no references to the independent contractor being an employee. Now, some organizations place probably a bit too much weight on just the contract because uh, the Ministry of Labor would look beyond the contract, but certainly having a contract in place that specifies that the working relationship between the company and the individual is one of an independent contractor relationship is important and one that we highly recommend. Next slide. So at a high level, independent contractors are not covered by employment standards legislation. That's very important. They're not entitled to reasonable notice of termination. Uh, the termination is what's in the contract and not what's judge assessed or what's in the Employment Standards Act. 
again, independent contractors are responsible for making their own tax remittances and are not subject to the company's uh, payroll deductions. So no CPP or EI gets uh, removed from their their uh, the pay that's provided to them. And again, there's no provision or payment of benefits. Uh, some examples, dental, disability insurance, uh, that's for the independent contractor to obtain. Next slide. <clears throat> So then we have uh, the next uh, classification, which is an employee. Employees work at, uh, at the employer's business. <laughs> they follow the employer's instructions on how and when to work. Hours of work are set by the employer. Uh, typically, a full-time employee will work exclusively for one company and has a duty of loyalty towards that, that company. And the employer is the one responsible for giving them the tools of, of, the, of the work and the equipment. So the worker is not responsible for bringing those on site absent specific circumstances. Employees are also uh, subject to the minimum employment standards under the applicable employment standards legislation. So for uh, industries in Ontario that are regulated provincially, it would be under the Employment Standards Act. And that sets out, as you know, uh, basic provisions like minimum wage, hours of work, overtime, termination, and severance pay, um, and, uh, and standards of that nature. Next slide. Uh, importantly, and as uh, my colleague Russell will be talking about, uh, employees are entitled to notice of termination. And uh, if there's no enforceable limiting termination language in a written employment contract, it, they'll be entitled to reasonable notice of termination at common law. Employers obviously make deductions from employees' uh, wages, and that would be for things like income tax, Canada pension plan contributions, and EI premiums. Furthermore, uh, many employers will choose to contribute to employee group benefits like health, dental, uh, long-term and short-term disability, group RRSP plans, things of that, uh, employee benefits of that nature. And, and of course, employees uh, also have the right to unionize. Next slide. Then we get into the middle category, which is the, the dependent contractor. That's an in intermediate uh, status between an employee on the one hand and an independent contractor on the other. They're technically self-employed, but there's recognition that the contractor is economically dependent on a single uh, work provider. And that if, and a finding that uh, an individual is a dependent contractor has implications such as common law reasonable notice of termination. Uh, for those individuals covered by labor uh, legislation, there's the ability to unionize, and that's very important to the construction industry. Um, and Furthermore, finding that uh, being an, a dependent contractor does not result in the individual being covered by employment standards legislation or being subject to payroll deductions. Okay, so next slide. Why do these distinctions matter? Well, <clears throat> some businesses obviously would prefer to use independent contractors because there's potentially a cost savings element. There's no minimum wage. There's no Canada pension plan or CPP. Uh, contributions and the termination entitlements are set out uh, clearly in the uh, contractor agreement. It can also be a bit more flexible when it comes to hours of work and less supervision and again uh, the ability to terminate for likely less cost than uh, an employment termination. Next slide. Unfortunately, um, if there's a misclassification of a contractor who ought to be treated as an employee, there can be significant consequences as listed in the slide. And those can be for unpaid overtime claims, vacation pay, holiday pay, or termination pay. There can also be liability for unpaid uh, income tax and CPP contributions or workers' compensation premiums if the um, assessment's not been done correctly. There can also be uh, potential liability for wrongful dismissal uh, damages, uh, unionization, and then it can also lead to um, class action uh, litigation if there's a whole group of individuals who have been uh, misclassified. So next slide. We'll move on in the interest of time 
to just a few recent case law updates on this employment and contractor status issue. So the first is the Thurston and Ontario Children's Lawyer uh, case that went to the Ontario Court of Appeal. On the next slide, please. <clears throat> So here, the appellant worked for the office of the children's lawyer for 13 years through a series of fixed term contracts. And the court found that approximately 39.9 or 40% of our annual billings were for the, the office of the children's lawyer. Um, now, the, the office uh, told Ms. Thurston that they were not renewing her contract. And she brought a claim for wrongful dismissal and damages for reasonable notice of termination. Now, the motion court judge in this case held that the relationship was continuous, even though there were a series of fixed term contracts for 13 years without a break. And because uh, you know, 40% or 39.9% of the billings came from the OCL, it was sufficient to tip the balance in a finding that Ms. Thurston was a dependent contractor. Next slide. It went on appeal to the Court of Appeal, and there the Court of Appeal explained what a dependent contractor is um, and what an exclusivity of work, and, and they looked at certain other, uh, certain other factors as well. Here, the contract contemplated that uh, Ms. Thurston could continue her private practice and confirm that she did not work exclusively for one organization. Um, and it, the contract reserved the right for OCL to terminate the agreement at any time. The tools and equipment were provided by Ms. Thurston through her own office, supplies and staff. And Ms. Thurston's pr private practice constitutes the main source of her income. So uh, the court therefore found that she was not a dependent, the Court of Appeal found that she was not a dependent contractor. Next slide. There's a case from this past year, Skimura and Skimura Contracting, uh, where the uh, applicant was uh, claiming to be wrongfully dismissed from a family business and sought reasonable notice of termination. Now, the, the company focused on the fact that this worker was paid through a number of corporation and had a lot of autonomy, but the court looked at a number of factors when assessing whether the worker was a contractor or a dependent contractor or, or an employee and found that the company provided the individual with all the tools uh, and equipment. Uh, he hired on behalf of the company. He was not given an opportunity to participate in the profits of the company. He was paid fairly regularly on a biweekly basis. He reported uh, to his uncle, um, and the reason he was paid through a number of company was to defeat a spousal support claim. So in this case, uh, the court found that the individual was an employee and that he was entitled to reasonable notice of termination. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, based on these cases and many others, uh, there's really no single test uh, that a court or a, a labor board will apply. But there are some common factors for sure, and, and we've listed them here. The control, ownership of tools, the opportunity for profit or loss, whether the working relationship is exclusive or the individual can work for a number of different organizations, how integrated that individual is to the, uh, to the, to the company, and also what, what's the intention of the parties? Is it to be a contractor or is it to be an employee? So the next slide is some of the best uh, practices and key takeaways from uh, these court and uh, labor board decisions. It's important not to rely on generalization or labels when it comes to worker classification, going again to what I said at the beginning. Um, and, but it is important to avoid engaging former or current employees to perform exactly their old duties but under a new name of being an independent contractor. Really, there does need to be a dif difference of the work re working relationship that an independent contractor does versus one that an employee or a former employee is doing. It is important to, to draft uh, an independent contractor agreement when hiring an independent contractor. Although again, um, that is given some weight, but not full weight by a court or by the, the labor board. 
Uh, and when considering the position, whether it's suited to being an independent contractor relationship, you need to think of how long is this going to last, the scope of the work, who's going to control the work, uh, who's going to help do the work, uh, what, what are the tools needed and who's going to provide those tools, and whether there's an opportunity for profit or loss. Also, it's important to require documentation from a worker demonstrating demonstrating proof of insurance, HSD numbers, things of that nature when it comes to hiring an independent contractor. And then on the last slide, the next slide, please. Uh, more best practices and key takeaways is ensuring that payment to a contractor on a project or on a flat fee basis is done uh, with invoices, uh, with an HST number where that's uh, required and not paid through company payroll. Uh, also micromanaging, you know, the details of how the worker performs the work. That is again, more uh, one that you would see in an employment relationship and not uh, one of the contractor relationship. Uh, when it comes to job titles and even things like business cards, it should be very clear that the worker is an independent contractor and not a position uh, that would be one of employment. And when it comes to performance problems and performance issues with a contractor, that should be dealt with through the contract as either modifying the contract or, or a breach of the contract and not as a disciplinary uh, problem such as issuing a performance improvement plan because that would be one, a performance improvement plan would be one uh, best suited for um, an employment relationship. So with that, that concludes my presentation. I'll pass it on to Larissa, who will be speaking about the Accessible Canada Act. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit, I'm now gonna be talking about a topic that is specific to federally regulated employers, uh, but those provincially regulated employers that are listening, please don't drop off, because as you've already heard advertised a number of times, uh, we have an excellent session on uh, terminations coming up with uh, Russ just after I finish speaking. I think I'm, uh, I know I'm certainly stating the obvious when I say that uh, everyone benefits when all people can participate equally in communities, in the workplace, uh, and so on. And this is a sentiment that is becoming increasingly part of the conversation uh, in Canada. Uh, especially because the reality is uh, wow, that many Canadians do continue to face barriers. And I'm sure each of you that are listening can think of someone that you know that's either been affected by a disability or perhaps you yourself have at some point uh, in, your, in your lives. Recognizing this, uh, the Government of Canada engaged in consultations, uh, both online and in person, between uh, July of 2016 and February of 2017, to gather more information on what accessibility means to, to individuals and how that meaning can be translated into new legislation. And the result of that uh, was an act to ensure a barrier-free Canada, uh, also now known as the Accessible Canada Act, uh, which was introduced on June uh, 20th of 2018. And as you'll see from the next slide, uh, this bill received royal assent on June 21st, 2019, and then came into a force shortly after on June 11th, 2019. So what is the uh, Accessible Canada Act? Uh, well, to start, it's an act that's designed to complement the existing human rights framework that exists uh, and is in place for federally regulated employers in Canada. And so any federally regulated employer that's listening right now is going to be very familiar with the Canadian Human Rights Act and the role that that legislation plays in preventing uh, discrimination and harassment on the basis of any protected grounds, including disability. Uh, you're also uh, likely very familiar with the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom uh, of 1982 uh, and the uh, equality rights that are protected within it. And both of these uh, different pieces of legislation play a very important role in the human rights landscape of Canada. And uh, so much so that when uh, preparing and drafting the Accessible Canada Act, uh, both of these pieces of legislation were explicitly referenced and highlighted in, in the preamble. Um, to, to borrow from the words of the government of Canada themselves, uh, 
the Accessible Canada Act is designed to build on this existing human rights framework that is, uh, is in place in Canada through a proactive uh, and systemic approach for identifying, removing, and preventing uh, barriers to accessibility. Uh, and, and so the intention, and this is stated in the purpose of the Act itself, is to create a Canada without barriers by January 1st, uh, 20, uh, 2024. Uh, and this will be achieved by identifying, removing and preventing barriers uh, in identified priority areas. Uh, and that includes uh, those that you see on the screen. So employment, uh, the built environment, uh, information and communication technologies. So for example, websites uh, and how they're formatted, uh, communication other than information technologies, which is, uh, for example, sign language interpreters or communication assistants, uh, procurement of goods and services, uh, design and delivery of programs and services. So for example, if a program uh, is offered in an accessible format, or if there are supports available for people with disabilities, uh, and then transportation, uh, including rail, road, marine, uh, all of those uh, things that we've probably all used once or once or probably many times in our lives. So at, at a high level, this legislation is aimed at removing barriers uh, that prevent people with disabilities from accessing these priority areas that are identified. Uh, and if you turn uh, to the next slide, um, the uh, Act recognizes uh, seven principles and the intention and the purpose is to carry out the requirements of the Act in recognition of these seven principles. And you can see them see them on the slide. I'm not going to go over them in, in detail because I'm mindful of time, um, but as you can see, these principles are consistent with the purposes that I've already discussed. There's the emphasis on being treated with dignity, having equal opportunities and barrier-free access, uh, taking into account policies and services and structures and how that interacts with uh, individuals who have disabilities and their accessibility um, all with the aim of achieving a high level of accessibility for persons with disabilities. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time now talking about the aim of the legislation. So I'm going to I'm going to turn to the particulars because uh, I'm sure that's what most of you are are more interested in. Um, starting with who the legislation applies to. Uh, if we turn to the to the actually you've uh, Peggy's already on uh, reading my mind. We're on the slide. Uh, at a high level, the Act applies to all organizations that are federally regulated. So that means uh, the government of Canada itself, any government departments, agencies, or crown corporations. Uh, that includes the private sector uh, that is regulated by the government of Canada or federally regulated, uh, which includes banks, uh, transportation, airlines, rail, road, uh, broadcasting, uh, and then the legislation also applies to the Canadian Forces, uh, Royal Canadian Mounted uh, Police, and to uh, parliamentary entities. Um, so turning to, to the main question that I think is on a lot of employers' mind as they, as they start to think about this legislation and what it means, uh, what is required by the Act, and, and when do you have to do it by? If we turn to the next slide, uh, I've, I've uh, summarized uh, the different requirements. Uh, there, there are a number of, of different bullets on the slide, um, but at a high level, you can think of it as three main requirements that employers have to be mindful of. Uh, the first requirement is to prepare and publish accessibility plans. And uh, in these accessibility plans, employers are required to make plans that identify, remove and prevent barriers in the different priority areas that we reviewed uh, on the first slide of my presentation. Um, and so the plan needs to be prepared, and I'll go over the deadlines for doing that uh, very shortly, and then it also needs to be updated every three years. And, and a, a notable part of the preparation process is entities that are uh, preparing their accessibility plans have to consult with people uh, with disabilities when they are developing and updating their plan. Um, and then uh, once the plan is in place, uh, they do need to have those uh, plans available in accessible formats or alternate formats. Um, once the accessibility plans are, are, in, are put into force uh, by companies, uh, an entity also has to give notice 
of the accessibility plan to the accessibility commissioner. And that's a new role that's introduced through the legislation. Um, and they have to do that within 48 hours of publishing their plan. Uh, there are uh, a number of very easy ways to do that, including sending it by an email uh, or other uh, electronic means like uploading it to a website and, and sending the, the URL to, to the Accessibility Commissioner, um, but you do have to uh, give uh, the Accessibility Commissioner notice of the plan. Um, the second requirement is to set up a feedback process, uh, and that's a process through which feedback is received about the Accessibility Plan, as well as the barriers that are being encountered by persons with uh, disabilities who are dealing with or engaging with the entity. And so the idea is to create a system through which feedback about accessibility is being received by the entity uh, and then dealt with by the entity. And then the third main requirement is to prepare and publish progress reports that are all related to the implementation of the accessibility plan. So entities have to make these regular progress reports they have to describe the actions that the, they have taken to implement accessibility in, in their institutions. Uh, they have to include whatever feedback it is that they have received and how that feedback has been taken into uh, consideration. And then, uh, like with the development of accessibility plans itself, uh, they, uh, the entity must also consult with persons with disabilities uh, while they are preparing these progress reports. Um, and then they must describe the consultation process that they engaged in in their in their progress report. So it's a little bit of a circular <laughs> circular process there. Uh, turning to the to the next slide and the question of when when do you have to do all this by? Because it does sound like a a lot of things that have to get done. Uh, you'll see on the slide there's actually three separate timelines, and the timeline depends on what type of federally regulated entity you are. So federal government departments, uh, the Canadian uh, forces, any government agencies or crown corporations, their deadline uh, for publishing their initial accessibility plans is December 31st, uh, 2022, so the end of this year. Uh, and it's coming up quickly since we're already uh, halfway through October, which is a bit unbelievable. Uh, if you're a private sector entity with 100 or more employees, uh, you've got a little bit more time. Your deadline is June 1st of 2023, so next June. Uh, so you have less than a year, um, but a little more time than the government itself. Uh, and then private sector entities with between 10 and 99 employees have to publish their plans by June 1st of 2024. So you have uh, over a year to get that to get that done. And while those timelines may seem far away for some employers, they are going to come up sooner than expected, uh, especially given the number of steps that have to be taken. Um, and, and it can be daunting to be preparing these from scratch. But fortunately, the government of Canada uh, is very mindful of that. And they have been publishing online a lot of information about how to achieve each of the three main requirements that I, I just reviewed. Uh, and they've been doing that through helpful modules um, and guidelines on what steps should be taken. Uh, another thing they've done to help make things a little bit clearer is uh, passed the Accessible Canada regulations, uh, which you will see described on, on the next slide. Uh, and these are regulations that came into force very recently on December 31st, uh, 2021, so um, just under a year ago. Uh, and they prescribe uh, the deadlines, that's where they were set, um, but this, these regulations also describe what needs to be included in the accessibility plan. Uh, it's, it confirms that plans have to be written in a simple, clear and concise manner, uh, that it has to contain information about how the entity's employees, uh, clients, and members of the public can connect with the entity, um, and must contain information, again, on the consultation process that was engaged in with persons uh, with disabilities. Um, but the regulations go even further than that. They actually specify the headings that have to be included in the plans. Um, so for example, there has to be a general heading uh, and that general heading has to uh, identify the title of the person that's designated to receive feedback from the entity, how communication with the entity occurs. Uh, each priority area that I reviewed earlier in my presentation also gets its own separate heading. Um, and then under each uh, priority area's heading, uh, then you have to describe the programs, uh, practices, and services that you have in place related to the identification uh, and removal of barriers. Uh, and then there's also a final heading uh, related to consultations, which uh, 
perhaps self-evidently is where you will describe the consultation process itself that was engaged in. I appreciate that there's a lot of information that is being thrown uh, at federally regulated employers right now, and, and my uh, presentation could go on for, for hours in terms of the specifics. Um, and, and, and a hard thing to think about is, how do I understand and digest this information? What's the first step I need to take? Uh, what's my strategy for developing an accessibility uh, plan? And so to, to end my presentation, I just want to go over some high level recommendations uh, as employers ideally start digging in uh, as soon as possible to the legislation uh, and the requirements that are imposed as a result. Uh, starting with uh, at a minimum and perhaps obviously make sure that you're reading the legislation itself uh, very clearly, that you're understanding uh, and reviewing the requirements that are in place. Uh, at a next level, uh, make sure to take a look at uh, and comply with the modules that have been developed. Because um, these modules are setting out the best practices, they provide detailed information about, you know, examples of efforts and activities that can be undertaken by an organization to remove barriers. Um, uh, one thing to note is that the um, uh, ESDC does recommend that employers think both short term and long term in terms of their goals for their accessibility plans. Uh, one thing to quickly note, if you are uh, in an industry uh, where your, the services you provide fall under the jurisdiction of multiple regulators, uh, then you're going to need to not only comply with the Accessible Canada Act, but any requirements that have also been imposed by those regulators. So an example is broadcasting. Uh, the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission has its own accessibility requirements that are applicable to broadcasting undertakings and uh, carriers and telecommunications service providers. So you would need to uh, make sure you're complying with any of those uh, requirements. Uh, similarly, Canadian Transportation Agency would be another example of a, of a different regulatory authority that would apply to transportation providers uh, in addition to the Accessible Canada Act. And so, uh, my final recommendation as I turn things over to Russ is uh, be proactive, get started as soon as possible. You may think that you have plenty of time, um, but as you will have heard, there are a number of steps that have to be taken to ensure compliance. And, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, uh, just feel free to free reach out to us and we would be happy to provide support with the legislation. And with that, I'm going to, to pass things on, on to Russ. Great. Thanks, Larissa. Thanks, Matt, as well, for uh, giving me a great lead up. Um, well, maybe save the best for last, at least the most fun stuff, I think. Um, it's um, one of the topics that's probably the biggest one in employment law over the last decade. Uh, it's not always good news for employers. Uh, so we're going to be uh, talking about some bad news cases, I think. But the good side is that the fix is relatively easy. Um, so we'll end on that note. So hopefully it's a, it's a high point. But as, as the title suggests, we're talking about contractual termination provisions and specifically how we make sure these provisions are not struck down. Um, like I said, this has become one of the biggest issues in Ontario in employment law over the last decade. Um, employee side counsel have been attacking these provisions and having them struck uh, by courts that are largely sympathetic. And uh, the rationale does make sense, but it can be infuriating for employers to watch the termination provisions get struck. Um, while it's possible to know for certain, uh, I would uh, put money on the fact that it, a majority of the termination provisions that existed 10 years ago in this province are no longer valid. So it's important uh, to get this one right. And it's easy to get it right. Um, so uh, switch, switch to the next slide. I, I should also note, actually, that while this presentation is going to be largely Ontario-centric, uh, um, I apologize to everyone in other jurisdictions, um, there is a very strong possibility that the law from Ontario is going to leak into other provinces, either naturally or because there's just so much litigation here um, on this topic, it will eventually get to the Supreme Court. It hasn't yet. And when that happens, there's a risk that it'll go across Canada instantly. So it's good to stay on top of it. And these are just general best practices. Okay, so in terms of an agenda, I wanna first talk about why we care about termination language in employment contracts, or what's so important about that. Um, then we're gonna talk about how uh, the best plans 
uh, fall apart, basically, um, how the contracts have been attacked and on what basis they've been found to be invalid. And then finally, we'll try and wrap it up with something a little more fun for Friday where we can do a little issue spotting and I'll get you guys to do some work uh, identifying issues and some sample termination language. Okay, so next slide. So let's start with a basic question. Why are termination uh, provisions in employment contracts so important? There are two primary sources uh, of liability um, in the employment relationship. The first is statute, which we're all familiar with in our various jurisdictions in Ontario. It's the, the Ontario Employment Standards Act 2000. The second source is uh, the contract of employment. And whether parties know it or not, they have a contract of employment wherever there's an employment relationship. Um, that employment contract can be either written in a format that we're all familiar with or unwritten. Um, so the unwritten contract comes about um, through the action of the courts. So where there is, for example, with a termination provision, either a lack of a contract, uh, there's a contract that doesn't contain a termination provision, or the termination provision is invalid and struck down, the courts will infer that the parties intended to provide reasonable notice on termination. Not to use the word, these air quotes are reasonable. Um, and that's what's called common law notice. So that's a court determined notice period. And she, there's no rule of thumb, courts are you know, very fond of saying that for determining that notice period. Um, it's generally dictated by the length of service, the age of the employee and the type of position they held with a view of seeing how long it would be reasonable for them to find reemployment. Um, with that said, it's often in the range of four weeks per year of service less any statutory amounts that were paid, but that number can vary wildly uh, based on a number of factors, and it can be very hard to predict, um, which creates the two main reasons why we want to have an enforceable termination provision in a contract. One is to reduce the cost. So we can bring the cost, if we do it right, down to of terminating an employee, down to the statutory minimums. We'll talk about why we can't below, go below that, but we can come down to the statutory minimums. We could set it at something else as well. Um, so that's the first goal is to reduce costs. The second goal is to have some certainty or uh, ability to anticipate what a termination will cost in terms of for budgeting purposes and so on. And if we can only find out uh, what is owed after costly litigation uh, to determine a common law notice period, it uh, it's, puts employers in a difficult situation where terminating an employee can be unpredictable and incredibly expensive. So we can avoid that with a predictable termination clause that's enforceable. We'll go to the next slide. So the primary way, and this is sort of the umbrella for everything we're going to discuss, um, for how these termination provisions that are otherwise uh, the parties hope to be enforceable when they sign the contract um, become unenforceable is when they try and contract below the statutory minimum. And the employment statute in Ontario specifically states that, that employers are not able to contract below that statutory minimum. It would be akin to agreeing to pay someone below minimum wage. It's not legal to do that. Um, now we have this language in Ontario, other provinces may have similar language, but in any event, courts will not enforce language that's otherwise contrary to the law or illegal. So um, there's a risk anytime you have a termination provision that's providing less than the statutory minimum. And once again, that's the jumping off point for where everything falls apart. And we're gonna walk through some cases in a little bit of a chronology. Um, I'll try and keep it light. I know it's Friday afternoon. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And we'll skip this one. Thanks. So one of the starting points, it's a, it was muddy at the beginning, but one of the starting points was this Wright uh, versus the Young and Rubicam group of companies. And in that case, the termination clause without cause termination clause in the contract uh, failed to expressly set out that benefits would be continued during the statutory notice period. And that's required by the Employment Standards Act. So the court struck that entire provision out and awarded the employee common law notice, despite the fact 
that the employer argued that they did actually continue benefits during the statutory notice period, irrespective of what the contract said, so they hadn't broken the law. The court found, no, it's, it doesn't matter what happened. It matters what the contract theoretically offered. And in this case, it was below the statute, so it was struck. Um, there's other cases where employees weren't even entitled to benefits, and still the court struck those clauses for failing to specifically state that benefits would be continued for the statutory notice period. Um, so let's look at the next case. So that was in 2011. This next one's, well, we jump forward a bit, 2017. There's a bunch of cases in a long line. But this Wood versus Fred Dealey Imports case, the termination provision didn't expressly call out for severance pay to be paid. In Ontario, we have that as a second kind of obligation at the time of termination, in addition to notice, that's statutory. And you can see an example of the language here that was a sample of the language that was in the contract. Um, and once again, the court struck this language and awarded common law notice and other decisions have held that even where an employer wasn't a severance employer or the employee wasn't entitled to severance, the lack of calling out severance pay would still invalidate the clause. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, so we come up another year to Nemeth uh, v. Hatch, and this was uh, where it started to really uh, widen. Um, so up until now, it made sense. Uh, you have to call out the specific provisions of the ESA for the clause to be uh, enforceable. Um, so that was easy to do. Uh, in this case, the language in the termination provision did all that, but it didn't say that that was all that was going to be provided or the only entitlement. It just stated you'd be provided with your statutory minimums and set them out. And so the court found that you have to expressly clearly say that the statutory minimums are all you are getting. You would not be getting common law notice or additional notice. Um, and, and specifically, they said clear and unambiguous language is required to change the statutory floor to a ceiling. So now we have to start adding this only language or expressly calling out the common law notice would not be provided. So next slide. So this brings us up to one of the more recent decisions, Wakesdale versus Swagen North America Inc., which you may have heard about. It was quite uh, popular when it came out. And on its face, it didn't seem to change a lot. It reiterated a lot of these same principles. It's, a, it's an interesting read, actually. Um, but this case was pretty interesting in that the employee uh, was terminated without cause. The employer relied on the termination without cause provision, which was fine. There was no issue with that provision. But plaintiff's counsel pointed out the termination with cause provision, which wasn't relied upon, was unenforceable. It, it went below what was uh, possible in the statute in terms of termination for cause. The decision actually doesn't spell out what the, what the uh, provision said, but it was agreed that it was below the statute. And so the court found that that entire termination provision was struck, uh, which really opened a Pandora's box because it leads us to say, well, what other parts of the contract, for example, maybe a bonus payment that may talk about entitlement during a notice period could be contrary to the ESA or below the ESA and therefore knock out the termination provisions. Um, so it just goes to show that we have to be bulletproof um, because the plaintiff's counsel will look for any way uh, to find these uh, provisions invalid so they can get common law notice, which is a big chunk for a lot of their employee, their employee clients. So next slide. Um, we can do some issue spotting. So um, we don't really have a way to vote here, but it'd be kind of fun to do that. But I'll give you uh, 30 seconds, maybe each one. So we'll look at, look at an example language and you can, you can decide if it's enforceable or unenforceable. So the company may terminate your employment at any time for just cause, which read that includes willful misconduct and breach of company policy. So what do people think? Is this enforceable or unenforceable? And we can assume there's other language in there. I don't want to reproduce a half page in terms of the other without cost provisions. Okay, hey, we can switch slides. So it's unenforceable. And this is exactly the issue that probably caught up the employer in Wakesdale in that the definition of just cause goes beyond the definition in the ESA, which is willful misconduct, disobedience, or willful neglect of duty that is not trivial and has not been condoned. If that definition is actually 
great, I think. It's quite broad. Um, it covers a lot of bad behavior. But when we include this breach of company policy, which a lot of termination language I've seen does include, and they usually list it, um, you know, they list specific policies that could be breached. Then it goes beyond potentially what uh, constitutes just cause, because it could be a mistake. It could be any number of things. Okay, next slide. So as example number two, the company may terminate your appointment without cause at any time by providing you with the minimum notice required by statute. So enforceable or unenforceable? Give you a second. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So it's unenforceable for like a variety of reasons. Um, one of the things we're just sort of keying into lately, or at least I have been with my practices, is language of any time. And the fear that someday plaintiff's counsel might say that that means you could be terminated without cause during a statutory leave, which could technically be contrary to the law, depending on the circumstances. Um, this language fails to include other entitlements beyond statutory notice, such as vacation pay, severance pay. Um, and it doesn't include the only language. Um, so there's lots of problems with this one. Uh, next one. So the company may terminate the employment relationship without cause by providing you with the notice or pay in lieu of notice, severance pay, benefit continuation, and vacation pay required by the ESA. Enforceable or unenforceable? All right, Peggy, next slide. So it's a bit of a trick question. The language itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's fine but it doesn't limit, doesn't have that only language. It doesn't prevent a claim of common law notice. Um, and uh, you don't want to end up having to uh, lose on this one. It's uh, very painful <laughs> to have to say all this does is uh, say that it confirms the employee's right to ESA notice uh, as opposed to limit uh, entitlement. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, the bad news. The law is not employer friendly on this area at all, and it's just evolving in a direction that's expanding and getting worse. It, the good news is, and this is a little uh, cheeky joke here from a uh, $6 million man, um, which is a um, TV show from the 70s that probably no one remembers, but we can fix it. We can build it better, stronger, and it doesn't need to cost $6 million. It's actually very easy to fix these clauses. We have precedents, templates. And we can spot the issues in these clauses usually within, you know, 30 seconds of reading it or sooner. So it's quite easy to fix. And uh, my view is always that an ounce of profession is worth a pound of pure. So I recommend that everyone have their employment contract templates reviewed annually to identify these issues and fix them. They can be fixed proactively for future employees uh, that are hired, but we can also go back and fix old contracts and have them resigned if, if needed. So um, once again, Problem is huge, but easy to spot and really easy to fix. And I think that's it. Oh, one more slide, actually. Sorry. We did actually create this great uh, termination uh, language toolkit that you can write to either myself or Larissa or Matt and, or anyone else at the firm and get a copy of it. Basically, it's this presentation with a lot more detail um, and a lot more examples and a set out for each jurisdiction in Canada as well, talking about how to get it right on um, termination provision. So we're happy to provide that if you uh, write, reach out to us and request a copy. Well, that's great, Russ. Uh, a lot of information there and a lot of ways to get uh, tricked up a little bit, but as you said, uh, also ways to fix it. So that's great. Uh, we've had a fairly active Q&A session, so I'll uh, go through some of the questions. The first one's for Larissa, and it's a question uh, or confirmation as to whether the Accessibility Act uh, does not apply to provincially regulated companies. That is that is correct. The Accessible Canada Act does not apply to uh, provincially regulated entities, um, but that doesn't mean that you don't have your own <laughs> considerations uh, related to accessibility. Uh, there is the uh, AODA uh, legislation, uh, which has been around for a while in Ontario, and that uh, does address uh, accessibility. So uh, the federal government was a little bit later to the game uh, to bring it in, um, but it does uh, only apply to federally regulated entities. And then another question, Larissa, was whether the aim of the legislation is to make Canada barrier free by 2040, which is in the slides, or by 2024, uh, in the two years from now. 
20, 2040. Uh, that was my, uh, my apologies on that. Uh, a little bit of a slip up. It is, it is 2040, which is the date on the slides. Great. Okay. Um, and then there's a question on what are other risks other than wrongful termination by misclassification of a contractor? Certainly there are more risks than just wrongful dismissal. There's the issue of whether there's been unpaid overtime, anything under the Employment Standards Act on hours of work. Um, also, whether the organization has not been paying CPP and EI premiums, income tax penalties, things of that nature. And then, of course, the, it also opens issues to whether the, uh, the worker can successfully unionize or not, because independent contractors cannot unionize, whereas employees can. Uh, Russell, there's a question for you as to what to do about employment contracts that have been created many, many years ago. Right. Um, and there's, I think, a related question around how to get new new contracts for existing employees. So it's never easy to do. Um, there's two methods. Um, one, you get your new template up and ready. And then when the employee with the old contract comes up for a, a raise or increase in benefits or some other increased uh, remuneration with their employment that wasn't already promised to them, you can offer them the contract, offer them the benefit uh, in exchange for them signing the new contract. And you'd want to expressly say that in the new agreement that they'll be providing X in exchange for signing the new contract. And we have to think about being fair there. We can't get the new contract signed and then you know terminate them and rely on it two weeks later. A court's likely not to appreciate that. Um, so as long as it's being done in good faith, um, there's really nothing wrong with that, especially if you're just correcting a technical error in the contract, you're not dramatically changing their rights. Um, and then well, I think one of the other con questions is consideration. Um, and that goes into the second way you can fix those is you could just provide people with new contracts and say, if you sign it, we're going to give you $100 or $500 or $50. Um, everyone who went to law school will know the old saying, uh, consideration, uh, sufficient consideration is a peppercorn. Um, and that's what, whenever there's a contract, you have to give something um, and then get something in return. So both sides have to give something. And the law is that it just needs to be as small as a peppercorn. So the consideration could be a dollar, but we don't really recommend that. Um, usually something in the range of 100, 500, $1,000 uh, for consideration for re signing a, a new contract um, is sufficient. And importantly, you can't pay that until the contract's signed. Uh, so you make, have to make sure it gets paid um, after they've signed. Great. Um, there's a, a, a good question here as to whether it's problematic to have contractors provide their basic details in a human resources information system or even to process their invoice payments through a payroll system but not as wages, but as a fee entry, or does it need to be completely separate? I think if it's very basic information, such as the address, the name, uh, that's fine to have through the payroll system, as long as, of course, it's being paid not as wages, and you've got like an HST number, and it's the, the um, contractor is invoicing for their work. Um, if it's done through the payroll system that way, with very basic information being kept, that's fine, but the moment you have things like who the dependents are and, and social insurance numbers and things of that nature, there it becomes more problematic. It looks more like an employment uh, relationship or information you would need for a, an employment uh, relationship. Russell, another question, what's, what are your thoughts about a company using a termination provision that they use in another Canadian province? Is that okay or is that not a good practice yeah um that is a one of the other topics uh if you if you ask us for the termination toolkit uh we'll send that to you it's discussed there so it's a great question um so we are recommending that the language be tailored for each province and not just have some generic language like in accordance with the applicable employment standards legislation um, and the basis for that is that the courts are really viewing the agreements uh through the lines of there being an inequity of bargaining power um, and so it needs to be very clear and unambiguous, and the employee needs to be able to understand what their entitlements are. Um, so setting it out in clear language and naming the statute is part of that. Okay. Well, that's perfect. And again, we do have that termination 
uh, toolkit fresh, fresh off the press that we'd be more than happy to provide those of you who, who would like to, to get a copy of that toolkit. Also, there is the Ontario Electronic Monitoring Policy Template and the Disconnecting from Work Policy Template. Again, uh, feel free to request those from your Denton's employment team member uh, via the links in the chat or the materials that will be emailed to you after uh, this webinar. Also be sure to subscribe to our Employment and Labour Law blog and the Canadian Employment and Labour podcast uh, to get the latest labour and employment updates in Canada. Uh, details can be found on the website and will be shared in the post-event email uh, that you'll receive uh, next week. We'll also be hosting the 36th session of our Legal Update for Canadian Employers. Uh, it's a webinar series uh, next or uh, Friday, October 28th at, at noon Eastern time. So uh, we hope to see you there. I do wanna thank all the speakers and those who joined us today for this third and last day of the Ontario series of uh, webinars. And we hope that all of you who joined enjoyed the, today's session and I will be able to see you again soon. Thank you all and have a great weekend. Bye.